going to do abrupt endings between the speakers. We're going to transition from one to the other and have a chance for questions between. So, um, and then, and then, I think the panelists are going to be able to ask each other some questions about the projects while panels on board up here. But at the end, then we're going to do like a roundtable discussion, so everybody will have a chance to speak. Where is Robert Scarone? Yeah, here we go. The Make it away. That's some intro, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, uh, I get my some dossier, but this okay. Is, let me let me just. Oh yes, here it comes. Let me yeah. do a summary. This is the architect who is capable of anything, who is willing to fight huh? for it, who has installed our first actual net zero multifamily building. Net positive. Right? By the way. Net positive. It's actually net positive in Brighton Beach, and we're all very proud of him. His solar installers are all present, so it's a perfect chain of discussion. Hi, everyone. Um, so this is my office here. Uh, we have an architectural practice. We're also doing real estate development now and construction. We kind of got into this world a little late in life, but they say it's never too late. Uh, we got tired of building all of these fancy, terrible, <coughs> energy, gluttonous jobs. So now we decided that the only way to change that paradigm was to actually make an example. So for the last two and a half years, we've been working on a pilot building in Brighton Beach, which is what I think the first multifamily net positive energy building that's actually also off the grid for everything, including gray and black water. We're gonna limit the talk today about it to the um, energy aspects, but if you have questions about some of the other things, we can talk about it. So, Brighton Green was a project that was basically conceived as a building that would be uh, something that could be duplicated. It's a six story, six family with a commercial space, so it's a mixed use building. It happens to sit on a site that used to be occupied by a small bungalow in Brighton Beach. It has probably the best solar um, orientation that I could have asked for. Uh, the primary facade is due south, so we took a, advantage of that. We used the solar PV to actually act as awnings and shade the windows. Uh, this building was built with a SIP panel envelope, so it's super um, sealed. It just went through the passive house um, modeling and got certified, and it basically blew a point three as a blower door, so it's very, very tight. But you can see the main roof array, as well as the arrays all over the windows, and then a combination of both uh, electric and solar domestic hot water on the second floor. So again, a really robust envelope is to me the beginning of this whole thing and in order to do that we experimented with this panel system. So a skeleton was built of steel and then wrapped with it because people told me that the most important thing about insulating a building is not integrating the insulation with the structure. As soon as you do that, you create a lot of problems for yourself, thermal bridges, things like that, and it would be the equivalent of trying to stay warm by swallowing your winter coat. The best way is it's on the outside, and that's the way this building is. The coat's on the outside, it wraps the building, it's continuous from the roof, down the walls, under the building, and back up and around. So it's basically like a hermetically sealed box. There's some details here. There was an existing um, cellar in the building that was there, which was a little bungalow. We reutilized the cellar as a crawl space to put in our water reclamation system and our black water treatment. Uh, what you see here is an under slab ventilation system. This was also a brownfield site. So we had to uh, create a system that allowed any residual gases to be transmitted up to the top of the building, as opposed to what they normally do, which is put a layer of pre-proof plastic and allow all the vapors to 
migrate to the natives. So we, we didn't really want to have that. What's interesting also is you see here, there's a, that white tube is a preconditioning earth tube that runs under the ground for about 140, 50 feet. That tube takes the outside air that we send to the apartments and preconditions it. And we're very happy to say that that's giving us about a four or five degree delta between the outside temperature that we pull in and the air that we send up into the units. The blue box that you see there is another thing that we used here that hasn't been used before, which is a uh, dehumidification machine called uh, a desiccant unit. A uh, liquid desiccant is something they use in ice skating arenas and in refrigeration plants to take humidity out of the air. One of the problems I found in doing these studies is that air conditioning, it's very difficult for the air conditioning to dehumidify without introducing heat. The desiccant unit basically utilizes some parts of the solar uh, uh, domestic hot water system for heat as well as a ground source well for cold water. We give it about a 40 degree delta and it takes about 80% of the humidity out of the air in the summer. But it does one thing even better, it also purifies the air. So we have probably what I consider to be a cleaner air than in Columbia Presbyterian's ICU. Um, this is a little schematic of the air distribution system. So again, the air is pulled in from the outside, runs into an earth tube, through, an, uh, through the uh, desiccant machine, and then gets pumped up to the apartments. Uh, it's pressurized in line, and then it goes through ERVs in each apartment. Why ERVs in the apartment? Because we don't want to just take exhaust air and dump it from the bathroom, because that's like taking $50 bills and throwing them out the window while you're driving on the highway. That air that we dump, we don't only just take all of its heat and moisture content, but we actually send it back down for a second cycle through an exchanger and then into the uh, desiccant machine and then we dump it. So we've extracted all of the potential heating and moisture out of the air before we expel it. And this is the particular unit we use, the Vantix. It's a pretty good machine. It's a low volume. This one is a low volume CFM because we have a small building. It's not a lot of square feet. It's about 7,000 feet, 70,000 thereabouts cubic feet. We need to push about 300 CFMs in total of air in this building. So that machine works perfectly for us. These are the cycles of how it works. And again, it charges the system by supplying it with very, very hot water and very cold water, which is why the solar domestic hot water system that we chose, which was an evacuated tube system, was perfect for this because at times we were delivering water at temperatures north of 190 and 200 degrees. And as a matter of fact, we, what was the record we got? We had some temperature that the, oh, the workers <laughs> actually wanted to leave the building when they saw the thermometer approaching 300 at some point. Um, geothermal, we also introduced. Um, geothermal, I think, would be used a lot more if the people that do the well drilling would get into line with the real world and not trying to work only one day a month in terms of you know how they charge you because I can tell you I knew nothing about well drilling but I can tell you that the four different vendors we went to through the tri-state New York area came in to within five dollars of the budget of each other we actually did the job at less than half of the cost of them by renting a rig from the environmental consultant that worked with us borrowing his rig and two of his guys to do the drilling, and we drilled 50 foot, we drilled 19 50 foot wells, put in refrigerant piping and also uh, water piping, and we did that entire job not knowing anything how to do it for half the price of the cost of the well drillers that we had. Are these guys related to dentists? Well, listen, I, I can tell you it's, it's definitely not a clean job. Um, I've done dirtier work, maybe fish mongering and things like that. But, you know, to work one day a week and make a week's salary on one day, it's a little bit uh, egregious to me. So these are just different geothermal technologies. We use a closed loop system of two types, refrigerant and water. 
because we, we have fan coils, so we need a refrigerant. This is the well fields out in front of the building, so there's a setback in front of the building which allowed us to drill these wells. They're drilled in almost like an umbrella fashion to get more contact. They only go down 50 feet. Why? Because the aquifer in, in Brooklyn especially has, was so pillaged in the 1900s that the salt water has been raised up to a point where we couldn't go more than 50 feet without running the risk of putting the copper into the salt water aquifer, which we didn't want to do. We did cathodic protection, just to be sure of it. And one of the reasons we picked a refrigerant-based system, because I'm not thrilled about putting refrigerant in the ground, is that if the well field fails, I can always go to an air-cooled, traditional air-cooled condenser and you know, still run my air conditioning. Which, by the way, for this six family building at the thousand foot office, is a measly five tons of air in a heat pump. Five tons, and that's a ton and a half too large. But I couldn't buy a smaller uh, refrigerant to water based heat pump. Uh, again, the SIP panel exterior, this is just a little section of it. It's basically foam expanded polystyrene. Uh, um, not polyiso, it, uh, polyiso. Polyiso. And the reason we picked polyiso is because we didn't know any better. We wanted the highest insulation value possible. It's an R50 or thereabouts. Would I ever use it again? No. So again, we have an insulation boundary and an air boundary that runs around the building and it wraps the skeleton. The skeleton is um, a steel skeleton, which I mentioned, which for us in the height we were talking about was necessary. It was also a hand-directed skeleton. We had no crane there because of the logistics on the site. So we had to do it with block and tackle. So the skeleton had to be extremely efficient and each piece light enough that two people could actually lift the piece and put a column or a beam in place without a conventional crane. So that's why there's a lot of diagonal bracing you'll see in there to make the frame rigid. Uh, I'm happy to say it, it was rigid enough, by the way, to go through Sandy. That building was in the, under construction during Sandy. We were the only building in Brighton not to be affected by Sandy, not also because of the way we built, but because we had the foresight to jack the building out of the ground two and a half feet above the 100-year flood, which basically flooded everyone out but us. So we ran uh, you know, our systems and basically powered the whole neighborhood for about a month and a half while everybody was getting back in order. So again, this is a typical uh, peasant house construction schematic that they show, air uh, extract, air supply. It's critically important that you have a system like that when you're doing a super airtight building that doesn't have a lot of leakage. Um, so that, you know, you introduce exterior air and move air. Everybody's seen these thermal images, so we don't really have to talk about them, but, you know, how the detailing of these buildings work in the frame and how the insulation meets the window frame is also important. Um, ERVs, they come in a wide variety of styles and types. I think this is a Zender unit. We didn't use Zender. We used um, Ultimate Air, which is a little different exchanger than this. They're all really good. Um, it just saves you from spilling out all of this air that you've done all this work to heat or cool. So the ERVs to me is a, is a standard that you should have. Marvin, I'm happy to say when I first went to Marvin, because I was using Marvin windows quite a bit, I like them, they're an American company, they make a pretty good product. Some people say maybe not as good as Germans or some of the others, but I think it's a damn good product. And one of the things I liked about it was five weeks after I'd make a call to my supplier and give them my window schedule, I got windows at my job. Which every European that I've ever dealt with and bought windows from, from Shuko all the way down to Clearwall, can't get me windows for 15 weeks. Even though they promise 10 and 12. Um, Marvin now got their windows certified by Passing House and they're taking the next step and they're getting their windows certified under the DECLARE program for the Living Building Challenge. And if no one has heard about the Living Building Challenge, I would say that you definitely look into that because that's one of the premier uh, programs in certifying uh, energy efficient building that there is out there. Much, much higher level than we. 
this was just the calculations on uh, leakage that, that we did. Yep, I'm at the end. So of course, green roofs. We have a green roof, both for farming and for beauty. We have a black water reclamation system, which is a worm composting toilet in the basement that takes care of the solids, the liquids are treated. It's a little schematic of the air tube, the wells, and the tanks for the water reclamation, 5,000 gallons. Of course, LED efficient lighting, our solar panels, there they are. How many kilowatts? Of 133 panels, uh, <coughs> total is... 34.58. He knows better. 34.58, and I think we've been doing more than that. And that's all the uh, certifications that the building is basically uh, involved in right now. And that's the view of it from the train. Q3. Q. Okay, I, I have uh, one question for you till the, that it's gonna relate to what I'm focusing my talk on. And Jeremiah is gonna come up next, so I'd like you to come over and address any questions to Robert if you have any of this. It's uh, your turn. I guess um, I'll get started and do that one. My, my question though is what percentage of the overall construction costs would you attribute to the solar thermal and the solar PV? Um, I think those costs added minimally to it. What One of the biggest hurdles for my organization was to get over that learning curve of being able to do a building of this caliber. So our soft costs for this project were much higher than normal. But I can tell you that typically the incidental cost after the grants and rebates from these systems is very, very small. And I don't think that is a deterrent from using it. If you start talking about blood, gray and black water processing, there may be some extra costs associated with that because they're not heavily subsidized. But as far as the energy for solar domestic and solar electric, I think to me the costs were negligible. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. Um, the sure. black water and gray water, uh, are they, in, is, is New York City allowing that now? Yeah. Well, we, we have uh, both a, a twin hookup the Living Building Challenge mandates that we have it, and we've been working with the DEP to get them to accept the system. They've already accepted that we have no stormwater discharge. They're now working to accept the fact that we are treating on-site water. What they want us to do is, after we fully treated it, which technically we could put it back in the aquifer, they want us to actually put it back into the sewer as opposed to putting it into the aquifer, which we don't want to do because we believe it's as clean, and we're going to show them that by testing it, but it takes a while. And most of the Living Building Challenge buildings have been fighting this fight now for quite a long time. And the Living Building Challenge started, who's putting it on? They, they've been doing these buildings for about five years. There's about 13 buildings that have been in it worldwide. It's the really, it's the holy grail of certifications. I mean, the equivalent between Living Building Challenge and LEED is like saying somebody's in nursery school and somebody's doing their PhD in nuclear physics. That's about how far away they are from one another. So these 13 buildings are pushing the envelope wherever they are around to get to the Yeah, and a, and a lot of them, a lot of them are in the queue to getting certified because one of the tenets of it is they will not certify you till you give them a year to a year and a half worth of empirical data to prove that you're doing what you're saying. So unlike LEED, which gives it to you immediately when you finish, they don't give it to you for a year, year and a half. Hi, Tracy, you're over. Thank you. Yeah. You're, we all have a lot of questions. There's so much material we talked about. Um, and we're going to uh, definitely have an opportunity to open this to discussion. Um, but let's let Jeremiah um, tell us about some technical and financing. Um, let's let some people sit down and come in.